Lord God, thank you so much for Jesus and your love for the lost. Thank you for sending us Christ to search and to save the lost. Give us your heart, Lord, for people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I'm going to preach on the parable of the lost coin in Luke chapter 15, and we'll apply it to our lives. A parable is a story with a big lesson, and Jesus loved to teach lessons using stories. There are over 30 different parables in the four Gospels, and each one of them has a specific spiritual lesson for us today. Luke 15 is in my top five chapters of the Bible because it shows us God's heart for the lost. I love it because we see why God sent us Jesus. It answers the big question of why. Why would God go to such great lengths to send his one and only son to die? Because he loves lost people. He loves his creation. And he wants to bring his creation back to him where it originally belongs. Today, we'll explore the parable of the lost coin and apply it to today. I remember growing up, lifting up couch cushions to see if there were any lost coins to add to my coin collection or to add to my savings for a new toy. Even pennies felt like treasure to me. When I found a quarter, it was the lottery. Before we left for vacation in Minnesota earlier this month, I cleaned the van and I found coins. Maybe when you clean your car, you also find coins underneath the car seat or in that what I call Bermuda Triangle, where things fall off the seat between the seat and the console and your hand just doesn't fit in there. In our world of credit cards, we often don't carry cash. However, lately, since more and more small businesses are charging a surcharge for using a credit card, a charge of like 3%, I am more likely now to carry cash, including coins. I have this coin collection with me in my backpack to pay for cash when the merchant wants to charge a 3% surcharge for using a credit card. So coins have become even more valuable lately to avoid processing fees. So we can all relate with the idea of coins and finding lost coins. Jesus wants us to see ourselves in his parables. I can relate with the main character in today's parable, the woman who has lost her coin. I've lost things before, and when I find them, especially when they're really valuable, it is like a treasure, rejoicing at finding something valuable. What about you? Can you relate with the woman who has lost her coin? And what does this teach us about God? What does it teach us about life today? Let's find out. Jesus starts off this parable with this. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. A little background is helpful here. Now, these aren't just any coins. Jesus uses the word drachma. This is the only time in the New Testament where the word drachma occurs. It's a Greek coin equivalent to a Roman denarius estimated to be worth a day's wage. Someone gave me this historical replica coins of the Bible, and you can see there are several coins here. This one's from Herod the Great from 37 to 4 BC. This one's from Herod Antipas, 4 BC to 40 AD. So one of these coins here is likely the one that Jesus is referring to. Ten drachmas would be life savings for a family enough to see them through a period when no work could be found. So these aren't just pennies that the woman is looking for. This is serious money. It's also important to note that a typical Mediterranean house had no windows or sometimes only one to allow natural light in. So there was very little natural light inside of homes, so a lamp was necessary for a thorough search. And Jesus 
He goes on to tell us more. He says, And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. So as you can see with coins this valuable, there is great reason to rejoice. Not just by herself, but with her friends and her neighbors. For now, she has all ten coins. There must have been a big sigh of relief with big smiles, maybe even a big holler. Then Jesus gives the punchline of the parable and he connects it back to God's heart. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Here is the first point from the parable. We were all that one lost coin, valuable to God, but lost. In the darkness of our own sinful ways, we were like coins stuck under cushions, unable to get free on our own. Knowing this, God sent Jesus Christ into the world like a lamp in the darkness. To be the savior of the world and do a careful search of his own house. To sweep the whole house, the whole world, and to find sinners. To find the outcast, the rejected, the dejected, the forgotten, the lost, and those who don't know that they're lost. The people sitting with him when he tells the parable are a sample of the people he came to save. Tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, and scribes. Each one equally valuable to God and each one equally lost. And the same holds true for us. Every one of us was lost at one time. The prophet Isaiah wrote, We all like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way. Thankfully, God went on a careful search. And how difficult was this search? Well, we've all been on a search when it was extremely difficult to find something that we were looking for. People used metal detectors, a magnifying glass, photos, video, surveillance cameras, During vacation last week, we went to the northern shore of Lake Superior, where people scour the beaches for valuable rocks like agates. That's us searching for agates, and we found some. The boys in Elan found several agates. The woman in the parable uses a lamp. And for God, he used the cross. The search cost him his life. That's how difficult it was. And he found you, and he found me, and he healed you with his own wounds. He healed me with his blood. And when he baptized you, he welcomed you into his kingdom, into his family, where you are loved. He washed away our sins. He cleansed us from our unrighteousness. And just like the one coin returning to the family of other coins, so God used a lamp using his son Jesus Christ to bring us back into his royal family. We were once mortals, and now we are royals in God's family with him forever. This is all because of Jesus' death and resurrection. He forgives our sins. He doesn't hold us against us. And he brings us back to where we belong. In his family, just like the woman in the parable, God had great joy doing this for us. In Hebrews, the author writes, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, once God finds you, he's not finished with you. He's not looking to build a trophy case of lost coins to put on a shelf in heaven to just sit there forever. That's not what he's interested in. He's not interested in collecting lost coins and putting them in his collection bin and just letting them stay there. No, when he finds you, he doesn't pull you out of the darkness, nor does he make you exempt from suffering or persecution. In fact, it may get worse. No, when he finds you, his lost coin, 
he turns you into his lamp. And that's the second point. You become the hands and feet of Christ. You become the light of the world, the church of Almighty God. The Apostle Paul called the church the pillar of truth. He transforms who you are so that now you shine for him in the darkness. That's right. In the darkness, he refashions you. He refashions the metal coin and he turns it into a lamp to shine his light. Just like a potter take a, takes broken clay from a broken pot and refashions it, God takes the broken pieces of that pot and puts it back together as a new piece of pottery for him. He refashions it all for a new purpose to look throughout the dark house for more lost coins. You are the light of the world. Therefore, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I mentioned this in my devotion two weeks ago on our YouTube channel that God's church is a life-saving station, just like a lighthouse. I brought you to Split Rock Lighthouse on the shore of Lake Superior. It's the most visited lighthouse in the world. And after a huge storm on the lake in 1905 killed 32 people, Congress allocated $75,000 to commission a new lighthouse that would save lives. And during the 59 years that that lighthouse was active and operated by the Coast Guard, not one person died in the waters outside of this lighthouse. Not one sailor sunk. The light could be seen for 17 miles away, and the foghorn could be heard five miles away. In the same way, God says, let your light shine. What many people fail to see in the three lost parables in Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, is that each of them, the lost, are brought back into the community where they belong. It's part of the restoration process. The lost sheep returns to the fold. The lost coin returns to the other coins brought back into the collection of the woman's lost coins. And the lost son is brought back into the family. When Christ saved me and you from our sins, he did that not only to save us for eternity, but to give us the benefits now of being a part of his family. See, Christianity in scripture is never only a me and Jesus thing. It's always a me you and Jesus thing. And that's why the church is so important. That's why communion together is important. I know you're watching this online, but I want to remind you it's important to gather in the flesh with the body and receive communion together for the forgiveness of sins. It's what the early church did. And the full picture of restoration includes gathering together, praising God, worshiping him, giving to him, supporting each other, holding each other accountable to the word of God and feeding on the word of God together. All of it is so critically important because we receive supernatural strength from the Lord when we are together. A cord of three strands is not easily broken, scripture says. So I want to tell you, that this is important for us now, especially since we've come out of COVID. We know what that felt like during COVID to be separated from each other, but now we're back. And on Sunday, August 27th, after the 10 a.m. service, we'll have an all-church picnic. Yes, the all-church picnic is back. The last time we did this was before COVID, and it used to be almost an annual thing that we did. I want you to know that we'll enjoy delicious food, brats, hot dogs, salads, desserts. It'll be wonderful. We'll have game time and we'll have plenty of time to enjoy fellowship and get to know each other more as the body of Christ to build unity together. 
You can sign up on your connection card when you're here in person next. So the community of God is where we belong. And when several coins become several lamps, the light becomes so vibrant that it fills the whole house with light, the whole world with light. And together, we shine like stars in the universe. Shining for Christ can take on many forms today. One of those is breaking down the dividing walls of hostility among communities today. Tuesday, youth from our church went to the zoo with one of our mission partners, C247 Father's Arms Ministry. It was awesome as communities from different parts of Illinois join together to build unity in Christ. Here are a few pictures from Tuesday. It was awesome. And I want to give kudos to the youth who participated. It's also helping people who need help. For example, there's some people from our church who recently moved to Green Bay. Well, this last week, some members of our church helped them to move to Green Bay so that they could arrive safe and that they could begin their work there. It was awesome to see people step up to help. And it's also helping strangers in need. Even people, when we don't expect it, who find themselves desperate for help. I want to tell you a story from last week that left me in awe of God's timing. During the course of this year, God was preparing me to help a family in need, and I didn't even know it. He was developing my skill set and competency with car maintenance to help a young mother and her daughter in need. Memorial Day weekend of this year, I learned how to rotate my own tires. Routine maintenance that should happen at least every 7,500 miles for most vehicles. I recently rotated the tires on both of our vehicles and it really lengthens the life of your tires, which is expensive if you don't rotate your tires. In the course of doing this, I learned how to change a tire, to take off a tire and put on a spare tire. This is a new skill for me. My son Jack and I recently performed an oil change just this last week on my Subaru, so I'm learning new things. It's High enough that we don't need to jack the car up, so it was a safe experience for both myself and Jack. It was a bonding experience. Jack is very interested in mechanical things, so he was all into it. Learning DIY car maintenance has been an interest for me throughout the year, and on our way home from Minnesota last Tuesday, we needed a potty break, so we pulled off in Edgerton, Wisconsin. We were headed to the BP gas station there. While we were taking the exit, we noticed the vehicle two cars ahead of us. The hubcap flew off the wheel and went off to the side. Amy noticed the same car had a flat tire and the driver pulled off to the side of the road. As I slowly passed that vehicle, I noticed it was a young mother and what looked like her two-year-old daughter. It was a hot, hot day. So I said to Amy, I'm going to offer to help her. I greeted the young woman who was on her cell phone. I introduced myself as Matt and she said, hi, I'm Rayana. I said, do you know how to change a tire? She said, no. I said, do you have a spare tire? She said, yes, it's in the trunk. I'll do it for you. She got out the jack from her trunk and the bar to loosen the lug nuts, and I carried the spare tire to the front. I changed the tire right there, and her tire was bald, completely bald with no tread. I actually punctured my thumb because the metal that bonds the tire together was showing. It just so happens that I had a torque wrench in the back of the van, so Axel and Jack held our stuff so it wouldn't fall out of the back while Amy opened the trunk and found the torque wrench and the socket that goes with it. I showed her that my thumb had been punctured and so she found some towels that I could use to hold the tire without injuring my thumb again. 
It really was a team effort changing this tire. I tightened the lug nuts to spec so her spare tire wouldn't fall off. Problem was, her spare tire was low on air. So I said, they should have air at the gas station. Meanwhile, my whole family was kind of shocked because we had never done this before. We pulled into the BP gas station and Rihanna was at the air vacuum machine. Sadly, it was out of order. I walked over and could see that she was in tears. So I went over to her and explained that there was a second air vacuum machine on the other side of the gas station by the large semi trucks. It cost $1.25 to use the air. She didn't have any coins and it took credit card. So I bought the air for her and filled up her spare tire with air. She said she was from Janesville, Wisconsin, and worked in childcare. She said she was going to go to Walmart to get a new tire installed. I said, be careful that you drive no more than 50 miles per hour with this spare tire so that you can arrive there safe. She thanked me, and I could see that she was shocked to receive such help in her time of desperation. I said, you're all set. Glad we could help. God bless you, Rayana. And when I got back in the car, Amy reminded us that God arranged things so that we could help her in her time of need. And it's so true. I said to Amy, it felt really good to help her like that. It prompted conversations in the car about shining our light for Jesus. Usually I'm the one who needs the emergency help when it comes to cars but this time, I was able to show God's love in a way that I've never done before. I share that with you as an example of God refashioning a coin into a lamp, refashioning a pastor into a car mechanic. Okay, so I'm not a car mechanic, just kidding. But having those new skills was useful to show God's love in that time of need. And I want to make this very clear that you are capable of learning new ways to help people in need. Learning new skills to assist your neighbor, to assist even strangers. Using your current skills and abilities to help people experience the love of God in a personal way that meets a personal need. I want to wrap up today by telling you about my coin collection at home. Over the years, I've collected coins that are valuable to me. I have a set of coins from the U.S. Mint produced in 1980, the year I was born. They were given to me as a gift. And it's not necessary that they're valuable to the world, but they're special to me. During Jesus' day, Palestinian women received 10 silver coins as a wedding gift. Besides their monetary value, these coins held sentimental value, like a wedding ring does today. And to lose one would be extremely distressing. Just as a woman would rejoice in finding her lost coin, so angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. Each individual is precious to God. I don't know where Rihanna stood with God, but I know that that day she experienced God's love in a very tangible way. And I pray that God will use that witness and that message of hope to turn her to Christ, who has helped us and the whole world in our time of need. I pray that we never give up searching, that we never give up praying, and we never give up serving the lost. Isn't that what it's all about? The founding pastor of Lord of Life Church, Pastor Scott Rishi, had a saying, the church exists for those who don't yet belong to it. Let's diligently seek the lost with our words, with our actions, with our prayers, and rejoice when they come to Christ the Savior. 
Lord, thank you for searching for us and finding us with your love. Thank you for refashioning us from coins to lamps. Lord, we are your light, and we're proud to shine your light to the world. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, Lord of Life family. My name is Dwayne Nelson. I'm sitting here in my prayer corner at home. I just have to say how blessed I am to be able to serve as elder once again. It's hard for me to believe, but Pastor Phil Ressler called me to be an elder uh, back in 2012. My wife, Betty, and I are so thankful to be a part of this Lord of Life family. We met here three years ago, and uh, we just have to say, God is good. I have one son and one daughter, and Betty, of course, has one son, Pastor Matt. And between the two of us, we have seven terrific grandchildren. Let us now turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Father God, when we worship you, as the psalmist wrote, help us to enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We give you thanks, we praise you, and make music to you, Lord. For you are good, and your love endures forever. We thank you, Lord, for our praise team that leads us in singing for joy to you each and every Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for the message that Pastor Matt just shared with us. Guide him always, Holy Spirit, as he continues to bring us messages that you have put on his heart to share with our Lord of Life family. We pray that we would have ears to hear what you just spoke to us through Pastor Matt so that we can draw near to you, O Lord, and love you more. And Father, creator of all, thank you for summer. Thank you for the warmth of the sun and the long days. Thank you for the beauty we see all around us and for the opportunity to be outside and enjoy your creation. But we know, Lord, that on this beautiful day, there are many who are hurting whether their ailments are physical, emotional, or financial. We all know members of our congregation, family, and friends who are going through tough times. We lift up our eyes to you, Lord. We know that our help comes from you, the maker of heaven and earth. Please provide abundantly for us as only you can, Lord so that we will know the gift comes from you and no other. Help us, the body of Christ, to be your hands and feet, to share your love and compassion with those who are going through these trials. We pray for and thank you, Lord, for the three ministries that our church supports in India. Gilgal Gospel Mission, New Life Missions, and Children of Faith. In India, now the most populous nation in the world, the harvest is indeed plentiful, but the workers are few. We ask you, Lord, to send even more workers to help our mission partners with their work for your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We wait expectantly and thank you in advance for answering. We pray all these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.